Hi, well, this uh, short video is about a man who wrote more of the New Testament than any other person, and yet you rarely hear him preached about. It's Luke, of course, the writer of both the Gospel and the Book of Acts. So what do we know about Luke? First of all, he was a very accomplished author, very well educated man. His writings cover 60 years with great attention to detail. It starts with the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus, and it ends at Rome at a time when the gospel had now been spread to most of the Roman Empire. He's quite an amazing storyteller. His writings are very accurate. The archaeologist William Ramsey wrote that Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, but should be placed alongside the very greatest of historians. It's quite a commendation. Professor E. M. Blakelock wrote, For accuracy of detail and for evocation of atmosphere, Luke stands, in fact, with the great Thucydides. Now, Thucydides was a notable and highly regarded historian around the period of the early church. He goes on to say, The book of Acts is not a shoddy product of pious imagining, but a trustworthy record. Hmm. Well, Luke was a medical doctor. Paul calls him his dear friend, the doctor or physician. He uses medical language. In Luke 14, Jesus encounters a man with dropsy. And Luke uses the word hydropikos, a very specific Greek word used by doctors of medicine and found nowhere else in the Bible. When Mark describes the sickness of Peter's mother-in-law, he calls it simply a fever, but Luke writes and calls it a high fever. And I'm sure that Paul was glad to have Luke around as Paul was consistently getting hurt or beaten and troubled with wounds. Paul calls him a beloved physician. And you can see his analytical training in his writings. Luke was most likely a Gentile. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, and Justice. These are my only fellow workers who are of the circumcision. Epaphras, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, they also greet you. And this suggests that he's not a Jew. Now, some say that the phrase of the circumcision means a Jewish Christian who strictly observes the rituals of Judaism, and that Luke may have been a Jewish Christian, but who did not strictly adhere to those rituals. But that seems unlikely to me. If in doubt, I tend to take the most obvious understanding of the words of the Bible. If you've got to push words to fit a meaning, I get a little bit suspicious. And I found that a good principle is to take the Bible at face value unless it says differently. If Jesus gave an allegory or a parable, then he generally said that that's what he was doing. He would say, the kingdom of God is like, or this generation is like, or he is like a man building a house, etc. And as a rule, most of the Bible tells us if the person writing it is being allegorical. And for that reason, I generally take the scriptures at face value unless it says differently or a weight of evidence points differently. So I'm happy to call Luke a Gentile with a Gentile Greek name from a Gentile city, the city of Antioch. We think he was born in Antioch. The Bible does not actually say this, but extra biblical writings, numerous of them do, particularly some writings that condemn the heresy of a man called Marcion, where the writer of that work talks about Luke being from Antioch, and this is widely accepted. Interestingly, after Jerusalem, uh, Antioch became the second home of the church. It was the third largest city of the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria. It had a population of about half a million people. It had a very large Jewish sector in a region of the city called the Caratheon. And it was here that the name Christian was first coined and first used. 
Before this, the body of believers were called the Way. Now, the number of believers in Antioch grew to around 10,000 and they met in 10 different assemblies. It was a huge number. It also seems likely that at some point Luke moved to Troas, but we can't be absolutely sure about that. He was not an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry and Luke himself makes this clear. He was a very dear friend of Paul and Paul called him my dear friend and in Philemon he refers to Luke as one of my fellow workers. In 2 Timothy he says only Luke is with me. Luke travelled extensively with Paul as we shall see. He looked after him when he was in prison, hardly ever left his side. He was one of only two friends that stayed with Paul when Paul was executed some years later in Rome. Like Paul, he remained a bachelor and he never married. He lived to a ripe old age, well into his 80s, and at that frail age was martyred for his saviour, whom he loved to talk about as often as he could. Luke was well-travelled, as we've said. He travelled to Rome, to Caesarea, to Jerusalem, all across modern-day Turkey and Greece, Malta, Troas, Philippi. His description of countries and cities and islands is vivid and it's won him many, many commendations. He travelled with Paul during the second and the third missionary journeys, which were much wider and further afield than the first journey. Now, Paul, Silas and Timothy picked up Luke at the city of Troas, which is here on the map in northwest Turkey, on the side of the Sea of Marmara. And today that city is called Dalian. It was to become a free city in the Roman period, which means that it was responsible to the Roman Empire and not to local authorities. It was a very significant port for sailing between Asia and Europe. And it's from here that Paul set off with three others in tow. They first went to Philippi. This was named after King Philip of Macedon, the troubled father of Alexander the Great. And whilst here, Paul cast a demon out of a young girl and ended up in prison with Silas. At the end of the second journey, they wound up in Israel at the amazing Herodian city of Caesarea Maritime. Luke stayed with a man called Philip in that city and looked after Paul. And here they heard tell that Paul faced serious trouble if he went to Jerusalem. And Luke pleaded with Paul not to go, but Paul would not be turned, so they went together. And from here, the crowds in the temple turned on Paul, who ended up under arrest. He was taken back to Caesarea Maritime and spent at least two years in jail at this particular city. Luke tended to him all of this time and during these years Luke spent much time with James, the just and the other believers in Jerusalem. Paul struggled to find justice and eventually he appealed to Caesar which as a Roman citizen he had the right to do and Paul and Luke descended these very steps and were dispatched on a boat to Rome. But the boat never made it. Instead, they were caught in a violent storm and they were shipwrecked. They made it alive to the island of Malta or Melita, as it was called at the time. And Luke stayed with the governor or a leading citizen of the island for three days, a man called Publius. And Publius was very generous and very entertaining uh, to them, we're told. During this time, Publius' father got sick and Paul laid hands on him and healed him. And such things must never have ceased to amaze a physician like Luke. Well, after three months on the island, an Alexandrian ship from North Africa arrived and took them on to Rome. And during this arduous journey from Israel to Rome, Christians from all over came to meet them and looked after them, gave them food, gave them shelter. And the Roman centurion that was guarding Paul must have been really impacted by all of this care and concern by other Christians. I wonder whether he ever turned to Christ himself. I'd love to know. We'll perhaps find out one day. Luke now spent two years with Paul in Rome whilst he was under arrest in a rented house awaiting trial. 
And so we come to what Luke wrote and why he wrote what he wrote. Now, we've already said that he wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, including Paul. So what was the purpose of these writings? And for that, we have to look at some clues. First of all, we know who the books were written for. And although we benefit from them, Luke did not write them for us and he did not write them for other believers. They were written for one man alone, a man called Theophilus a man with a title, the most excellent Theophilus. And interestingly, this phrase is used elsewhere in the New Testament. It's used of Festus and Felix, who were trial judges. It's a, it's a title used of court officials and lawyers. And it begs the question, why would Luke write such a detailed account of the faith and the life of the apostles and the life of Paul in particular, specifically for a lawyer or a court official or a judge. And it's led numerous theologians to believe that Theophilus was the defending lawyer or the judge in Paul's trial. Now, when you read the two books of Luke and Acts with this in mind, it makes much more sense. It talks about the founding of this faith, the life and the innocence of Jesus, the good works that the faith was involved in. It talks about how Paul came to be so involved with this group of Christians. Luke had great opportunities to interview the other apostles and we know that he spent much time with James and with Peter amongst others. And the first book or volume, as Luke calls it, would have been researched during the years that Paul was in prison in Caesarea. And then he had another two years in Rome where he could have written the book of Acts, his second volume, as he calls it. And it explains why in Luke's writings the Roman authorities are pictured as sympathetic to Jesus. Why the Roman governor Pontius Pilate three times called Jesus innocent. It explains why the book of Luke has the strange beginning that it does. It says many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know with certainty the things that you have been informed about. What an interesting start to the book of Luke. Compellingly, it also explains why the book of Acts finishes so very abruptly. It stops with Paul awaiting trial under house arrest. Now, if this was an account of Paul's life, why stop there? So much evidence points to Paul being found not guilty at this trial. We know of many other things that he did and went on to do that are not mentioned in the book of Acts. He almost certainly wrote to Timothy and Titus after this first trial. Contemporary writings and traditions say that he was freed from his first trial. And there are hints that he even went on into Spain and Western Europe and started churches over there. Acts doesn't end with Paul's death, it ends with Paul under house arrest saying this. Then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And then the book ends. If the writings were written to act in Paul's defence by his learned, articulate and great friend Luke, then it makes complete sense why it ends right there. It did its job. Well, we don't know for sure, but it makes sense to me that this was written in Luke's defence. Well, read it yourself, research it yourself and come to your own conclusions. But we thank God that Luke's writings provide us with so much more than just a defence account. They are a unique perspective of the gospel from a man who was careful and detailed with his words. Luke's work declared what faith in Jesus was all about. 
He taught us so much about how to be a faithful follower of Jesus, taught us how to endure, how to share the gospel, how to behave in so many different circumstances. Now, one of my heroes is a man called Polycarp. He was an elder at the church in Smyrna, modern day Izmir in Turkey. He was an old man and he knew that the authorities were coming for him. And the church loved him so much they begged him to flee for his life and he did flee, finally fleeing to a friend's house in the countryside. And he then questioned what was he doing and he refused to run any longer. And the soldiers took him from there, so rough were they that he was thrown to the ground and bones were broken. He was put onto a horse and he was taken back to the city of Smyrna and he was tied to a stake because he refused to deny his Messiah, Jesus, even though he was a grey-haired old man who could not take much suffering. And the proconsul of Smyrna said to him, deny Christ and you can go free. He said, I beg you as an old man to consider your grey hairs. And Polycarp replied, 80 and six years have I served Christ and never did he do me any injury? How can I blaspheme my King and my Saviour now? He went on to say, you threaten me with fire that burns for just an hour and maybe a little while longer, and then it's extinguished. But you're ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. And the age of 86, Polycarp died a martyr's death, a remarkable death. And that's Polycarp, an old man who was not going to deny Christ. He understood about being faithful to the end, about being faithful unto death. And Luke himself was the same. He was faithful to his Lord until the day that he too was murdered as an old and grey-haired man. Never did he betray his Lord and Saviour even though there's no account of him ever meeting Jesus. He was as faithful in death as he was in his life, a faithful man, faithful to his friends, faithful to the faith, faithful to his Messiah. My dear friend, the late David Pawson used to say that Christianity is not just a way of life, but it's also a way of death. And we've so much to learn from these giants of the faith. Luke died in Boeotia, a province of Greece, just northwest of Athens. We've no written evidence of how he died, but oral tradition is very early and says that he was hung from an olive tree because he loved his Lord and he refused to dishonour him. Well, we thank God for him. I can't wait to meet this man and have a chat with him one day. God bless. Oh, by the way, I've been told that if you hit the subscribe button down here and then click the notifications bell and the thumbs up like button, it really helps. Only if you wish so. Cheers.